Good afternoon and welcome to Navigating the Iowa General Assembly website presented by the Iowa Public Health Association. My name is Janine Moody and I'm the IPHA Executive Director. I will serve as the moderator for today's session. Due to the number of attendees on this webinar, all participant lines will be muted during the presentation. To submit a question for our presenter, please use the questions feature in your GoToWebinar control panel. I will monitor all submitted questions and pose them to our presenter during the question and answer portion of the webinar as time permits. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted along with the presenter slides. A few technical tips for optimizing your webinar experience. One, utilize a USB headset. Two, use a wired connection versus wireless if possible. And three, Close any applications on your computer which require large bandwidth. Now, let's meet our presenter. Deborah Thompson has served as the policy advisor and legislative liaison for the Iowa Department of Public Health since 2011. Before joining IDPH, she spent four years at the Legislative Services Agency as a legislative analyst. There, she assisted legislators in crafting annual appropriations budgets for departments like IDPH and the Department of Human Services. Most significantly, she has 13 years of hands-on experience navigating the Iowa General Assembly website, making her eminently qualified to present to us today. With that, I'm pleased to turn this session over to you, Deborah. Okay, Deborah. Yeah, hi, Janine. Thank you. I like the words eminently qualified. <laughs> You're welcome. I, like that was I felt good about that. Um, okay, let me get my screen up here, and I want to say good afternoon to everybody. I appreciate you guys taking the opportunity or taking the time um, and allowing me the opportunity to um, help you understand the General Assembly's website. We have a lot to cover. I will um, hopefully have left time for questions at the end. I, I, uh, I won't brag about um, timing this very well because I didn't, but we'll get through as much as we can and I feel pretty confident we'll have some room uh, for some questions. So um, there is a lot on this agenda. I'm breaking all my rules about having busy slides, so I apologize for that. Um, but I do want to just say uh, that the legislative website, as you can see here, is a um, it's got a lot of rich resources once you understand how to use it. Um, in fact, I'm only gonna scratch the surface of what it's capable of showing you. And based on some conversations I've had with others, I'm gonna fo focus on the following topics. Um, so how to create a list of bills to track. So we'll go over um, where to look for the introduced bills, how to uh, do bill searches, and then monitoring the progression of the bill. So what I'm gonna do is take a live, or sorry, a bill that passed last year and sort of relive its existence in the process um, during the 2017 se session. Um, and then understanding how to read legislation, understanding how to um, discern its impact on public health issues, and I want to start with a disclaimer that there's really no right or wrong way to navigate the website. I'm showing you how I do it. I'm sure there are better ways. Uh, feel free to volunteer those better ways uh, for the good of the cause. Um, so I don't want you to think that um, the way I do it is the only way to do it. Okay, so let's see. Um, so here is the website in all of its glory. There are uh, quite a few links. Um, they call popular links and popular publications. You can see up here, this is the navigation bar. So we'll um, click around up here. Um, if you know the, the, the bill number that you want uh, to pull up, you just start by putting it in the quick search field here. Same with an Iowa code section. So again, we're gonna start with the idea that you're going to create your own bill list. And from there, we'll follow the history of a bill that was passed and signed last session to see how it traveled through the process. So you'll begin by pressing on the legislation tab up here. That's step one. And then you'll go to um, 
this link in the middle of the page called the daily legislation or the bill packet. Uh, you can actually get uh, the bills um, from each chamber each day printed out. And so that's kind of a holdover from the time where that was the only way to get the bills was by getting the bill packet. But we know that everything is um, digitized now. Um, so let's see what the bill packet looks like. Well, it's blank right now because session hasn't started and there's no bills. Uh, I will show you a populated list of bills though in a second, but I wanted to point out a couple of features here. Um, most of us don't have to deal with the legislature every day. Um, those are the lucky people in life. But for those of us who do, we, we typically um, will check the bill list every single day. But for those of you who maybe only have time to check it once a week or maybe just a couple times a week, just know that they archive most of the documents, um, uh, all of the documents. And so if you just go to the date here and do the drop down, you can pick on whatever date you left off and then go through the dates that you haven't gone through yet. The same with a year. Um, this was this would probably be more to. Um, research a topic where but they allow you because they do such a good job archiving all the information um, you can actually do a search by year and since the internet's working pretty well I'm gonna go ahead and show that to you you'll have to excuse me I'm gonna toggle back and forth I don't expect um, internet to ever be uh, reliable and so I did a lot of screenshots, but since uh, you can't see the drop down from my screenshot, we'll take a look at what this looks like. So you see how you can um, look back to previous general assemblies and find this information as well. Get it? Okay. Um, so let's go back to my slides and we'll take a look at a populated list here. And so um, the bill packet will look like this. This is a list of all the introduced bills for that day. And uh, you can sort, all of these are sort functions. You can sort it by the bill number, by the sponsors. It lists the official bill title for the introduced bill. And so what I do is, you know, just take a quick look um, at the title of the bills for any um, keywords that would indicate to me I should be interested in the bill. So, you know, for example, if Senate file 84 talks about headlamps on voter, uh, motor vehicles, I probably don't care about that. Vehicle repair, no. Uh, let's see down here. Oh, okay, here, uh, mammography reports to patients, Senate file 77. So I'm familiar with this bill because it's come up before, but we also have a mammography program or radiological health program, so we probably need to be interested in this bill. So I don't know, uh, of course, from the title what the bill does, um, um, so I'll need to explore a little bit more. But before I do that, I just want to point out um, the crazy thing about bill numbers. So uh, it's kind of confusing, but bills will get new numbers at certain points in the process. Most bills that are actually introduced, they are introduced as study bills. So that means they'll either have a SSB before the number or an HSB. So that's Senate study bill or House study bill in front of their number. The exception to this, because it's important for everyone to know there's exceptions to literally everything I'm going to say, um, but the exception to this uh, are the bills that are filed by by the legislators who are in leadership positions. So that would include the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the majority and minority leaders, assistant minority and majority leaders, whips, and so forth. So Senator Amy Sinclair is um, an assistant majority leader in the Senate. She is a Republican. So her bill was given a file number instead of a study bill number. As the bill advances in the chamber of origin, and the chamber of origin is where it was originally introduced, it will receive an updated bill number each time it passes a committee. So in the chamber of origin, the bill numbers will change every time it passes through a committee. So a bill can go through more than one committee. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it will. Um, 
Let's see, once it goes over to the second chamber, the bill number will remain the same. So it's only gonna change in that first chamber. I'll talk about this, I think, again, uh, in a little bit. So as you're creating your tracking document, it's a good idea to create some space for the new numbers to accommodate that. So in our hypothetical, I clicked on this bill because it might impact the department, but I'm not sure if it does or not. So how do I figure that out? Um, Oops, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So I've clicked on the bill number and it pops up this screen. And oh my God, there's a lot going on in this screen. Whoa. Um, it's really rich with resources, I can tell you that, but there's a lot going on. So don't worry, we're going to get through um, most of this. So, okay, what does the bill do? Um, I always start with the explanation at the back of a bill. Every introduced bill gets sort of a... Uh, a summary at the back. It's kind of like turning to the back of a mystery novel to see who the killer is before reading the story. But it gives you a gist for what the bill is intending to accomplish to the best of the bill drafter's ability to, to understand it. So these are, uh, all the bills are drafted by um, legal analysts at the uh, Legislative Services Agency, and they take a, um, a their best guess at what the bill, it's an informed guess. I mean, it's not you know, completely out of the sky, but um, they try to put it in layman's terms so um, the rest of us don't have to suffer through the legalese to understand the gist of the bill. So right here I can see, oh, well, we're completely named in this bill, the Department of Public Health. Uh, so we will probably need to track the bill and then find out more precisely what the bill does and how it will impact our programming. So let's look at how to read a bill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, bills are organized into sections. So here we see section two. Each section impacts the Iowa Code differently. So it's not a novel. It's a section by section of where different Iowa Code sections are being impacted. So that's why when you try and read a bill from page one to the end, um, it reads funny because, again, it's not a novel. It's choppy. Uh, until the bill reaches the governor's desk, it will have these line numbers and then a page number at the bottom. So you would read the bill. So section one starts on page one, line one. This is page one, line nine. Um, so you read this as uh, section two will amend section 136C, subsection 10 of the current code, and it will amend it to read as follows. So the underlined language is being added to an existing code section. I don't see any strike throughs like this. It would look like this. This is a st strike through. So nothing's being removed from the code. So it looks like we get more responsibility. So let's take a look at, okay, so we know this language is going to go under an existing code section, 136C10. I'm sorry, 136C3. Um, so now we've got to go back and figure out what that code section does. So we do this by returning to the home page, and then we put the code section directly in this field here. It's a quick search because we know the section we want to pull up. Um, 136C is under the department's regulatory chapter for radiation machines and radioactive materials. Hopefully you're thinking to yourself, wow, is there anything that public health doesn't do? And the answer is no, there's not. So next we'll look for, see, we're at 136C3. We will look for chap, I'm sorry, paragraph 10 down here, because we know that that's where the language will be added. Um, and so here is where we would expect to see the additional language from Senate file 77 to be added. And then what they'll do is put a letter in front of the existing language. So this will become 10A. And then the additional language will become 10B and 10C. 
So now you can go back to the bill with a better understanding of what, what program area it's going to change, uh, what the current language in the code is, and how the new changes will impact the, um, the current code language. Okay, so what else do we know when we pull up the bill? So um, we figured out basically, because I already know, that Cenophile, 7, uh, Cenophile 77 requires mammography facilities to put certain information in their letters to patients who have de um, dense breast tissue. But what else? Let's take a look at this busy side of the screen again a little closer to see what else it's going to tell us. Um, so we can see that the bill was introduced and referred to Senate Human Resources. It doesn't say Senate, but since it's a Senate file, we can assume that it's Senate Human Resources. Um, I get excited when I see this because I'm used to working with these legislators. Uh, we can see here that a subcommittee has been appointed and the senators on that subcommittee are Senator Sagabart, Mark Costello, and Pam Yocum. A subcommittee is typically made of three members. Occasionally, it can have more. Since the Republicans have the majority in both the chambers, for right now, they will always have more members than the Democrats. So Senators Sagabar and Costello are the R's, and Pam Yocum is the Dem. The subcommittee will also have a chair, so there's some formality to this. The person listed first is the chair. So Senator Sagabart will be the chair of this subcommittee. And a um, subcommittee chair has quite a bit of power at this stage. I'll explain that in just a second. Collectively, these three people are the audience for the lobby and constituents. So right now in the process, they're the three most important people to talk to. Uh, a bill can die in subcommittee very easily. And so they are the first people to persuade. They, make, uh, they will make recommendations to the full Senate Human Resources Committee as to whether or not the bill should advance to the next stage of the process. So you really have to get them bought into your bill. The chair of a subcommittee can kill a bill by choosing not to hold a public meeting on it. And this does happen, but not often. It's also rare that a committee chair so the, the Senate Human Resources Committee chair would override a decision made by the subcommittee chair. So that's why the subcommittee chairs have a lot of power in this step. So I'll say that again. So, well, that's confusing since Senator Sagerbart is both the chair of the subcommittee and the, um, and the Human Resources Committee, but say Senator Costello was the chair of the subcommittee, Senator Sagerbart wouldn't necessarily um, go against the wishes of Senator Costello at this stage, unless he had a vested interest in this. And, um, and that's exactly what happened. So in fact, Senator Sagabart is again, the chair of the full Senate Human Resources Committee. He had a particular interest in seeing this bill pass last year. So to help that along, he appointed himself as the chair of the subcommittee. And this ensured that it would be brought to the full committee for a vote. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was how he assured that would be the case. The chair is also responsible for scheduling a public hearing on the bill if he or she decides to have one. And this is called a subcommittee meeting. The public hearing is where the lobby gets to discuss the bill in front of the legislators and each other and offer amendments. It's uh, frowned upon for the lobby to um, sort of, um, I mean, we all talk to senators individually, but you are sort of expected to say in private what you would also say in public. And so it's frowned upon if you're only talking to legislators in public and not saying these things out loud so that everybody can hear your thoughts on, on the bill or uh, your thoughts in your organization's thoughts on the bill. Um, Okay, so now we know what the bill does. We know who we need to contact about the bill, but let's see down here what our friends in the lobby think of the bill, because this is going to be an early indication of what the discussion will look like at the subcommittee meeting. Okay, so I clicked on the lobbyist declarations tab. And I'm looking and I'm looking. There's me. I'm undecided as always because it's not our bill. A uh, couple of fours. Oh, got some against. Four. 
more again. So, uh oh, these are most of the medical organizations are telling their lobbyists to oppose this legislation. And this is a typical response to any pieces of legislation that mandate standards of care. This one is mandating a standard of care by making the um, uh, the, the radiologists send some additional information in their letters to patients. Um, you know, we can be sympathetic to some extent to the public health community because we also like flexibility in how we perform our jobs. But occasionally we are told by the citizens of Iowa through their elected officials that we need to be doing something they believe is far too beneficial to leave up to, to chance. So that's where requirements come from. So I can tell you, since I was there at the subcommittee, that this was an intense dialogue and that the legislators in the subcommittee, um, the, so the subcommittee members were very, very in favor of the bill, even though most of the lobby was not. And Senator Stegabart was pretty clear with the lobbyists that he intended to get this through the chamber. Um, it had passed the, the chamber the year before unanimously. Um, so he was kind of putting the medical community on notice that they need to get on board with the bill. And this is in part because, again, this bill had already come up for like five years now. It was grassroots advocacy. Um, and I suppose people always root for the underdog. Um, and I just think in his mind it was time to put the issue to bed. So his direction to those who were opposed to the bill was to find some common ground with the people who were for the bill and find a compromise and then give him some amendment language. So let me fast forward and let you know that this bill did pass the Human Resources Committee, um, but the uh, amendments that Senator Sagabart requested were not ready yet. So um, the committee did an amendment, even though, excuse me, the committee did not amend the bill, even though they could have. Um, so they uh, decided to amend the bill on the floor. But how did I know that it passed? Okay, let me back up and I'll show you. Another document. So we'll go back uh, to the home page and we'll press on our legislation tab and then we'll take a look at the link underneath the bill packet, which is the session daily. So the session daily comes out daily and um, looks like this. I'll show you how to sign up for both of these two in a minute. But this publication tells you what actions have been taken on a particular bill each day. So this screen tells me that Senate File 77 passed the Senate Human Resources Committee by a vote of 13 to zero, so unanimously on February 13th. See, right here, February 13th. Um, Let's pause, uh, or excuse me. However, um, I need to point out here that now we've got another bill number that's just popped up. So remember that I said uh, a bill will get new numbers once it passes a committee, and that's what's showing up here. Senate File 77 became um, Senate File 250 now that it passed Senate Human Resources. And so the House Chamber which will be the second chamber since the Senate was the um, chamber of origin, the House chamber will now receive this bill as Senate file 250. So we'll be tracking it that way moving forward. Um, the bill would have shown up again on this list when once it was voted out of the Senate chamber and sent over to the House as well. So this shows us the committee action. It'll pop up again when um, it gets voted out of the Senate, it'll be up here and it'll show again the votes and where you can find more information in the Senate Journal, which I'm not gonna go over today, maybe um, maybe next time. Um, okay, so let's pause to see how we get signed up for these publications. Um, we'll go back to the home screen and you can either click on this link here or this itty bitty little tiny subscribe link down here and it pulls up this list of different things you can get. And so again, we're interested in the daily legislation and the session daily. You can also get clip sheets, which show the amendments, the debate calendars, the journals, which again is um, a list of all actions, not just actions taken on bills, but you know, um, subcommittee assignments and so forth. I don't use those all that much. Um, public hearings, weekly calendars, so you know when the committees are meeting, 
um, and then some uh, additional things down here that uh, have to deal do more with uh, administrative rules than, than code. Um, also up here, and I'm not going to click on this, um, but so we're on the legislative subscriptions tab. There are also committee subscriptions, so you can um, sign up for committee notices to understand when the meetings are taking place. They also provide the, um, the, the subcommittee meetings um, for the committees of jurisdiction, uh, meeting, or sorry, agendas and minutes. Um, and then the department subscriptions are basically anytime you want to hear about all the great stuff public health is doing um, in terms of how we're interacting with the legislative branch, uh, you can sign up to get information from us too. This is also probably a good one as well. Reports required to be filed with the General Assembly. Um, it's probably little known, but there's an online submission system that the legislative liaisons use to submit our online reports. And then it shoots out um, a notice if you're signed up to get these so that you guys are aware of when a department has finalized and submitted a report that might be due typically in December. So sign up, get too much information, it's all good. So getting back to our bill, let's recap. The Senate Human Resources Committee has passed the bill out. Its next stop is the chamber floor for consideration by all 50 senators. The bill received a new number, Senate File 250, so now it's called a committee bill. So Senator Sinclair's name has been replaced by the Committee on Re Human Resources, so it's like they're taking ownership of the direction of the bill. And then remember that I said that Senator Sagabar asked the lobby for amendments. Uh, well, IDPH uh, facilitated a discussion and consensus was achieved. You know, public health conveners, yay. So we provided the agreed upon language to the Senator and he filed it as an amendment to the bill. And so here's what that looks like. So you can see the list of amendments here. Here's his 3134. Uh, and then when you click on that, it pulls the amendment here. And so you see this split screen, uh, the, the bill language is up here and then the amendment shows up here. So let's look a little closer about what the amendment's going to do to the bill. Okay, so amendments are organized numerically by operation. So this is operation one in front of us. If you click on the number one, I think this is neat. If you click on the number one, it will hyperlink to the exact page and line number where the bill, I'm sorry, where the amendment intends to change the bill language. So I clicked on this and it popped me right up to line nine because page one of this amendment, I'm sorry, because this amendment is going to strike the lines in the bill that are on page one, lines nine through 33. So all this stuff is going away up here and it's going to be replaced, inserted with this new language. Okay, so um, when you look up and down at both versions, you can clearly see where the language is changing. So, you know, the first sentence reads uh, in the current version, before being uh, amended, that we have to adopt rules by January 1. Uh, the mammography services will include information. And then down here in the amendment, you can see that, well, we still have to adopt rules by January 1, but we have to collaborate with appropriate stakeholders. Um, well, you can just tell that some of the language has changed. When floor amendments are adopted, um, when floor amendments are adopted and the bill is passed by the first chamber, then the bill is reprinted to incorporate all the changes from the floor amendments before it's sent to the next chamber. So the new version turns pink, that's lovely, isn't it? To let readers know that it was amended by the previous chamber. The session daily will have Senate file 250 listed uh, again in the March 14th publication and we'll tell the reader that the vote was unanimous at 49 to zero. So this is called the reprinted version. I can tell because it says it up here and because it's pink and it's got a little footnote to tell me when the Senate passed it so that I can look back at the journal, maybe to see what votes, uh, who voted in what way, or I can take a look at the session daily if I need to. Um, and an important thing that's kind of a pain, I wish it didn't happen, but it does, the explanation falls off the bill. 
Um, it'd be nice to have an explanation of what the amendments do, but I suppose that's job security for the lobby. So I don't know, but it's hard for the public to ascertain that. I feel it. I get it. So again, what else do we know? So we'll go back over to this right hand pane. I'm sorry, the left hand pane to see uh, what else we can figure out um, now that the bill's got a little history on it. My favorite thing are these video archives. Uh, if you want to go back and see how the debate um, unfolded, then go back to these archive videos and you can see them. Uh, they really tell you a lot about the way legislators are thinking of the bill. Uh, for me personally, I like to see whether or not IDPH information was used in floor remarks, um, if they cited any of the stuff from our one-pagers that we typically bring to subcommittee when we have information to share. It's pretty good. Another great feature of this side panel is that it shows you the bill's history. It's like having all the session dailies in one place. And this is especially great if a bill has just come on to your radar, which does happen to me sometimes where I've missed a bill. Um, you know, maybe my eyes were just tired when I was looking through the bill packet and I missed something. And so I've got to scramble to see, oh my God, I missed something. Uh, where is it at? How much time do I have? Who do I need to talk to? Um, so the bill history helps me ascertain all that information fairly quickly and easily. So picking up again on Senate file 250, we can see that the bill came over from the Senate on March 14th. So here's that message from the Senate. Um, it was assigned to the House Human Resources Committee uh, on the 15th and a subcommittee of representatives Best, Marty Anderson, um, and Shannon Lundgren are assigned um, to, to study the bill more in depth. And remember, since Representative Best was listed first, he's the chair. Marty Anderson is the Dem. And then Shannon Lundgren is the other Republican on the committee. The history also shows us that um, this bill was passed out of the full Human Resources Committee. So these guys liked it told the full committee to like it too. And so that full committee passed it out uh, on March 21st. Uh, and then we see up here that it passed the full house chamber by a vote of 96 to two on April 4th. And so for things like that, it's fun to click on the house journal. And I'm sorry, I didn't do any screenshots of that, but now I'm finding that it, it may have been of interest. So maybe next time. But um, I always want to know who's voted no. Why are there just two no votes? And the House Journal will tell you that. Not why they voted no, but who voted no. Since the House didn't make any changes to the Senate version of this bill, it can go right down to the governor's office for consideration. Um, last year, of course, it was Governor Branstead. Um, and if the House had amended this bill, it would have needed to go back over to the Senate for their agreement. But they didn't do anything to change the bill, so we can go right to the governor's desk. Um, okay, let me see here. So before the bill is sent to the governor's office, there is a review by either chamber's legal counsel, so the lawyers in the back room, and they um, try and ensure that everything was procedurally followed, so the bill is legit and that the amendments were incorporated properly. And once they sign off, the bill is formatted into the enrolled version. Okay, so it looks a little different. The line numbers come off, the page numbers stay, but the, the line numbers come off. I think the page numbers must be down around here somewhere. Um, and then there are lines um, here at the bottom for the official signatures of the president of the Senate, the speaker of the house, the secretary of the Senate, and then um, Governor Branstead. Uh, so since it's the secretary of the Senate because the bill originated in the Senate, see, if this was a, a, a house bill, then um, Carmen Bowles name as the chief clerk of the house would be listed here. Now we don't see the signatures. Um, but because uh, this is all digitized, but there is a, an, an actual copy with the um, Secretary of State's office that has these signatures on it. I believe that's true. So now it's at the governor's desk. Um, I think I should explain, too, because sometimes there's a discrepancy. I, I, I need to talk about this over here. So sent to governor and signed by governor are two different things. 
Um, I'll go over the options the governor has, uh, but sometimes it freaks people out. So here you see there was a nice succession. Okay, they, they reported it correctly. They sent it to the governor. Um, but sometimes there's a delay. Sometimes this enroll date is, uh, we'll say it's the 11th. But sometimes the sent to the governor doesn't happen for like another three or four days. So this is done out of respect for the governor's position in terms of uh, being a face around the um, around the state, right? Like so, sometimes she'll be, he or she will be out and about, or you know maybe they're in China trying to get economic development going, uh, trade missions, what have you. And so they're not in town. Um, so the the chambers will hold the bill for the governor so that they can have a fair shot at um, really. Um, reviewing the bill and not having to do it when they're overseas. Um, so they'll hold the bill for a little while. It doesn't mean anything bad. They're just being respectful of the governor's schedule. So um, when it does get sent to the governor, the governor will have a few options to either sign the bill, veto the bill, or item veto an appropriations bill. Um, so if they sign the bill, you know, it obviously becomes law and that's it. If they veto the bill, um, and the difference between a veto and an item veto um, are as follows. A veto, so for a policy bill, so say the bill, uh, like the one, like Senate File 250, it doesn't have anything to do with money. There's no money given to the department for it. Um, snarky comment here. But um, the... Uh, um, so it's a policy bill. So the governor can only either sign it or veto it. She can't take any other action on it. It's either all or nothing. For an appropriations bill like the Health and Human Services bill, the Education Appropriations bill, you can she can actually go into each line and veto paragraphs, veto different actions. So it's not all or nothing on an appropriations bill. The legislature can in turn override with two thirds members of each chamber voting to both consider the bill again and then um, also voting in favor of the bill. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this happen. So it's a rarity, um, but there is uh, the, the ability to do that um, because we have a beautiful system of checks and balances. The other thing she can do um, is take no action. So if they decide not to take any action, um, this is called, I wanna get this right, this is called a pocket veto. Um, so a pocket veto occurs when the governor fails to take action within, um, oh, excuse me, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. Um, she can take no action on the bill and, and if that happens, um, the bill will become law after three days. Um, there's another caveat and that's where the pocket veto comes in, I apologize. Um, the bills that are received on the last day of session, um, so people always talk about the crazy night at the last day of session when bills are being brought up and um, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but if any of those bills that get passed by the legislature on the last day of session, the governor actually has 30 days to sign or veto or take action on the bills, 30 days. So a pocket veto occurs if no action is taken after 30 days of inaction. So Governor Branstad signed Senate File 250 on April 13th, and the department's been working on implementation ever since then. Um, I just have a couple more slides left, although I did put some extra slides in in case we've got um, additional time to go over them. But one last thing I want to hit on is kind of a biggie. Um, since over 2000 bills are introduced during session each year, they have to create ways to narrow the focus. 2000 bills every year. So yeah, they have to focus in on a few. And so these are done through funnel deadlines. And you can find them on the session timeline by using the link on the home page. So again, this is our links area on the home page. We go way down here to session time, excuse me, session timetable. And this thing pops up. So this has a lot of information on it too. Uh, but I've circled the two funnel deadlines, one and second funnel. Excuse me, the first funnel occurs after the first six weeks of session. And all you have to do is get your bill out of a committee, just one committee. So all we had to do for Senate File 77 is get it out of Senate Human Resources and it survived the first funnel. 
The second funnel occurs four weeks later. By that time, you have to get it out of one chamber and then a committee in the next chamber. So you have to have, um, it had to have gotten out of the Senate chamber, Senate file 250, and then in addition to that, out of the House Human Resources chamber. And it did that, you know, because it's, a, it's now a law. So at the bottom of this is all the exceptions, and there's many, many exceptions to this. Um, primarily, it's appropriations bills, and this is mainly because the appropriation process kicks in about this time. Um, so they're not going to kill probes bills before they get started. Ways and means bills are the same, government oversight bills, leadership bills, so plenty of exceptions. Um, bills that have died in funnel, I always say there's no such thing as dead legislation. Bills that have died in funnel can always be resurrected as amendments, but it is a much higher hill to climb. Um, this kind of helps you understand where you are as a priority in terms of uh, what they intend to accomplish by the end of session. And if you don't want to do any of that, you don't want to deal with the website, sign up for my legislative update. Um, I can pair a lot of this back for you guys. You just go to the department's website and I'm under the director's office. So if you just punch in director's office here, um, Garrett's pretty face will come up and then over to the side, you'll have uh, legislative communications and engagement. And then that this pops up my legislative update. You can see all the archived issues and then um, punch your email address in here and uh, you will receive them uh, every other week. Um, yeah, every other week. Let's see if there's anything else I wanna say on that. Okay, so that's, that's all I've prepared today. Um, I've left about 20 minutes for questions, and if I don't have questions, then I've got a few other things that we can mess around with on the website if you guys are um, well-fed at this point and not ready to go. Thank you so much. That was a lot. <laughs> a lot, but the, it's it, it, it's a really rich resource, and I have to say, um, I caught a few gems there and jotted down a few things for myself too. So I appreciate it. Good. Um, so just um, open that back up to everybody. Remember that you're all muted, um, just so that we have some clarity on the line. But please do use that questions feature in your control panel. So that's that little pop out on the side of your screen. And if you click on the questions pane, you can submit any questions that you might have for Deborah. And I'm happy to revisit any of these slides too, that if, if maybe I went too fast over them. No, I don't think so. And I, well, yeah. I'll let people respond to that, I guess. And I'll also just point out, because it's always a question, is what about the handouts? So Deborah has graciously um, provided her slides. I put them in a PDF format. And for those of you who are live on this webinar, you can go to the handouts section also on the handy dandy control panel, and you can download those right now. And that was a question that came in just a minute ago. So look at that. Okay, here's another question then for you, Deborah. Here they come. Okay, uh, you mentioned that you were listed as undecided in your example because it was not IDPH's bill. Are there any exceptions to this? And do all state agencies follow this rule? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, state agencies are not allowed to... Um, uh, we're always supposed to file, sorry, I'm, let me get my words together here. State agencies aren't allowed to register for or against a bill unless we've been directed to by the governor's office or unless it's our own bill. So I will have one department bill this year that will make some technical changes to the medical cannabidiol bill. And so, yeah, I'm going to definitely register for my own bill. Um, I have never been asked to, I think I've only registered for another bill that was not our department's bill. It was a governor's priority. So I think it was last year's um, texting bill. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, all of the agencies work with their policy advisors on that. Um, and it's, a, it's an enterprise-wide uh, directive. Okay, thanks. I know I get that question um, on behalf of IPHA. Where's the department on this? And I always tell people yeah. that's not, it's not a barometer of where the department is by any means. 
Yeah, that, no, I appreciate that, Janine, because that's true. It's not a barometer of how we intend to support the bill. Um, you know, if it's a good bill, we'll show up with information and we'll talk about um, the possibilities of how it can impact um, statistics. We're going to do more of that. We want to move in a direction where the information coming from the department is more actionable and less about here's some numbers, make up your own mind. Um, there will be still some of that bit because it's a transition, but we'd like to be a bit more proactive than we have been. Right. Well, we all would be for sure. <laughs> We're proactive. Proactive. Okay. Yeah. Another question. When we review bills and have concerns, what are our options to engage legislators? And an editorial, this person says, Great job with several exclamation marks. So good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, okay. So let, that's a great question. And that had to do with some of the extra slides. Ah, sorry, I almost escaped out of here and that would have been bad. Um oh, no, wait, I need to. Janine, can I go back to uh, the website? Um, yeah, if you just minimize your oh, slides. Sorry, I had to aggress. I had to press more aggressively than I was. Okay, so yeah, so okay, I've got something to share with legislators. They really need to know this information uh, about this bill. Um, you you would start in two places. I would start if I were you with the committee subcommittee members. Uh, specifically the committee chair, subcommittee chair. Um, and so we went over that, um, oh, back here when I was pointing out what else we know about the bill. So on the side screen here, these subcommittee members are who I would start with. So I would start with Senator Sagabart. I would also start with the committee chairs too which also, again, happens to be Senator Sagabart. And then, because um, they're, they're, they're sort of in the, the decision-making seats at this point in the process. And then I would always, always include, and that's where I'd like to look here, your legislators, your personal legislators. Um, so here you go to the legislators tab, you click on find your legislator, and then your zip code, your address is going to get you the most precise. Um, uh, so mine is 281 Irvindale. Oops, I'm an idiot here. 68th Street, drop down to good old Irvindale. Search. And these are my guys. So um, it's actually, and that's the thing, like you kind of have to click on these Senate districts because Jake Chapman is actually not my Senator. I'm not quite sure how the algorithm works here, but I would encourage everyone to double check on the Senate districts because Jake Chapman's like way out in Dallas County. So he has part of Urbandale perhaps, but I'm nowhere near this guy. So, um, so Brad Zahn and, and John Forbes are mine. Um, the reason I would make sure that I include, uh, oh, that's funny, now Jake's disappeared, weird, I don't know. Um, anyways, I would include them because if you start to contact other uh, legislators who are not your own, it's very easy for those people to say, well, you know, I'm not, you're not one of my constituents, so please contact your legislator. And so here you can say, well, I've done that, but I also want to make sure that other members of the committee are aware of um the information I'd like to share. So uh, so I've directed you towards the chair of the subcommittee, the chair of the committee, your own legislators, and then um, you can also contact other members of the committee um, in of jurisdiction. So you do that by clicking on this committee's link, and then we'll go over to uh, Senate Human Resources, where the bill was that we were um, focusing on. And here's all these people that you could contact if you wanted to. And so in order to get their information to contact them, you would click on their name. And then here's their contact information down here. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, and Deborah, I'll just add on to that. So remember, Deborah's here talking about the nuts and bolts of this. 
But I'll add from an IPHA perspective that sometimes when I send action alerts out to you all as our membership, um, we a lot of times if, if we're starting with a little more strategic approach and not blasting the whole world, we will query the IPHA membership database by your districts. So here is a plug for you to please keep your IPHA membership profile up to date. If you move, um, if you haven't filled out that information, pull up that membership profile and make sure you look up your Senate and House districts and have those up to date in your profile because that's a data point on which I query our membership database. And then I would say, hey, um, Chris, you're a constituent of Senator Zahn. He's on the subcommittee. Um, we'll, we'll reach out to him as IPHA, but it would be really great if you heard from some public health professionals who are his actual constituents. So following up on that strategy, please make sure your IPHA data is up to date as well. Um, okay, another question for you, a, a couple more here, Deborah. Regarding a pocket veto, can you explain why a governor would choose to take this option? <laughs> Are you <laughs> trying to get me in a politician's head? I don't know. I don't I think that's why um, I think that's why they're they're very seldom used. That's the, you know, I'm a policy person, guys. I'm not, I try and keep us out of politics and, and stay away from it because it gets gross. I would imagine it has to do with some, like, you know, there's political pressure from the constituency, but maybe one of your donors doesn't like the bill. So, you know, it's kind of a way for you not to have to publicly say one way or the other how you feel about a bill. And uh, and then the bill just gets passed. There are a lot of political pressure points uh, in the final stages of a bill. Again, if the lobby hates it, but there's a particular legislator that the governor wants to maintain a good relationship with, um, and that legislator wanted to, the bill, you know, perhaps you got to do a pocket veto or just sign the bill because that relationship is more important than. Um, than the lobby. I don't, you know, that's all stuff that I don't really probably care to know. I'm sorry, that's not a great answer, but uh, that's stuff that I'm not privy to. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, another question, and we'll remind people just to use that question feature um, in the in the GoToWebinar control panel. Another question, Deborah, what kinds of advice can you provide that one should not do with an action alert? So I'm thinking that means like, so say you receive an action alert from an organization, um, what should you not do with that information or in your results? Well, I don't, you know, I, I don't, um, okay, so I, I guess the first thing I would do is make sure that you're not violating any of your agency's policies. Um, when I get action alerts from my PHA, I tend to forward them immediately to my, um, personal email if I intend to send something or I delete them, but I don't use my um, office uh, equipment to answer action alerts because their specific purpose is to lobby. Um, and so um, I also, and Senator Johnson said this at the IPHA Legislative Forum too, um, I would take the um, uh, initial language that Janine or others may provide as like template language. I would work it a little bit, put some personal things in so that you stand out as a, as a person that um, is not just providing canned responses. So I would, I would say I'm in your district. Um, I am a public health professional with specific expertise in this matter. I would really like to talk to you about it and make sure that you understand um, its potential impact for good, for better, or for worse. Um, I, I think that personalizing it to the best of your ability and to the best of your your time limitations will go much further um, because they just end up. I mean, one of my things I did as a Senate intern was delete canned responses, and there were thousands of them. I just sat there and deleted them out of her inbox. She didn't read them. I mean, she didn't have to because they all said the same thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, that sounds like an awful job, but yeah, it was, it was horrible. Right. Right. <laughs> um, another, yeah, I mean, again, I don't want to stray too much into advocacy strategies for this session, but that could be something else that we do later. But another thing is don't underestimate the power of social media um, to engage them in a productive, constructive, professional way. 
um, especially at the federal level, our, our congressional delegation is pretty good about um, responding to us in that platform in Twitter, which is, is kind of a new and different thing for us. Um, that's the end of the questions that um, I'm seeing. I do see a people, few people have their hands raised. And just to remind you, we've got everybody on mute. So Deborah, we do have just a couple minutes. Do you want to try to move into your slides? Um, your additional I guess I could... bonus slides? My bonus slides. Well, I did the legislators. So the last thing, so sure, the last thing that I'll point out um, that I typically use in my trainings for IDPH staff, I, I don't know, people like the Schoolhouse Rock video. So I went over the process quickly. Um, the Schoolhouse Rock video is easily found on YouTube and um, is still really, really relevant, even though the video is grainy. It's, I mean, it's not like the process has changed in, in several decades. It has not. Um, and then on the General Assembly's website, this is a flow chart of how an idea becomes a law. Okay, so it kind of captures the stuff that I've said in a, in a more concise and precise way. Um, and then, uh, and I'll show you where to find that on the, on the website, but um, and then I always like to use my Russian nesting dolls as a visual for the subcommittee, standing committee, and full chamber. So let me go quickly to the resources uh, page. If you want to learn more details about the process, take a look up here at this resources and civic education. Um, and this is more information of these different processes in more detail. So here's the flow chart, how an idea becomes a law, how a bill becomes a law is a narrative. It's got more details, um, you know. So that's just helpful for you guys to under, to know that, it, that that's an available resource. And that's really all I'll say. Other than wish me luck, think of me often. Uh, um, if your friends or family, I'll see you in April. <laughs> and again, I appreciate the time that y'all have taken to be engaged in the in the legislative process. It's our, it's our democratic democratic right and responsibility so thank you great thanks so much deborah really appreciate it and i will um, just take a minute or two here to wrap up and say a few final words Okay, we move through the Q&A. So first and foremost, a huge thank you to Deborah Thompson for joining us today and sharing her expertise. Um, this might be something that we're willing to explore and do a deeper dive on a few issues. And so thanks for being so gracious with your time and your talent with us today, Deborah. And this is also a great opportunity for me to invite all webinar participants to join us for our next offering, the 2018 Public Health Day on the Hill, which will occur on Wednesday, January 31st. Registration for this partner event is open on the IPHA website. Please go to www.iowapha.org and click on events to register. Registration is free. This is um, a public health day on the Hill that we do in collaboration with all the partners whose logos you see on this flyer. So please do plan to join us for that. And thank you to all participants for spending this time with IPHA. If you're an IPHA member, thank you for that investment in our collective work and mission. If you're not yet an, an IPHA member, we invite you to consider membership. We need you to join us to build a shared value for public health in Iowa and in our nation. As you log off today, you will receive a brief, I promise it's brief, four very simple questions in the form of an evaluation. And we would very much appreciate your feedback on today's session and input on future IPHA webinar offerings. Thank you and have a good day.